Biochemistry is always happy hour, right? Uh, before I start today, one of the things I want to uh, do is welcome um, a visitor that I have uh, here from um, Turkey, uh, who is um, a uh, professor there who's here to um, uh, watch me teach biochemistry uh, to you. And so this way, if I'm mean to you, she'll be making notes of that and everything, and so taking all this back to Turkey with her. It's uh, Dr. Narmin Saragol, and uh, she's sitting right up here up front. So uh, please welcome her. Uh, Okay, um, so we're um, into the citric acid cycle, and we have uh, some work to do in the citric acid cycle. And um, I hope uh, that you'll see in going through it that, first of all, it's a cycle that in many ways I think is, is simpler than glycolysis. <clears throat> and as I noted uh, on Monday, the uh, regulation of the cycle itself is much simpler than glycolysis. Glycolysis really hit you in the face with gluconeogenesis, with glycogen metabolism, and you saw that those were very complicated regulatory uh, systems that cells had set up to uh, control those. In the case of the citric acid cycle, as I noted um, on Monday, the regulation is very simple. Okay? It's very, very simple. In fact, we're not going to pay any attention to what's listed as allosteric regulators because allosteric regulation doesn't really play any kind of significant role in the citric acid cycle. So that's a, that's, that's a good thing uh, for you. Okay, so reviewing very briefly what I talked about last time, we started the citric acid cycle. We noted that it, first of all, was a cycle, so it doesn't really have a start or an end, but that traditionally people talk about the cycle starting um, at the place where the acetyl-CoA enters the cycle. So the entry of the acetyl-CoA is a necessary part of the cycle because without it, then there is no way to generate that six carbon intermediate. So we have to bring in these two, carbon, two carbons from the acetyl-CoA, otherwise the cycle cannot itself run. These um, are added to the molecule exaloacetate. Exaloacetate is a um, four-carbon intermediate, as I noted, that is commonly found in many metabolic pathways. It's a very important intermediate in our cells. The reaction produces citrate. And by the way, wherever we talk about intermediates in the citric acid cycle, you can ignore them. We're not going to worry about what the intermediates are. We're worried about what the products are. Okay? So the uh, reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme known as citrate synthase. And citrate synthase um, is uh, uh, an enzyme, well, the, not citrate synthase, but the reaction that's catalyzed by citrate synthase is energetically very favorable. And that favorable um, uh, reaction helps to pull the reaction previous to it. So when we come all the way around the cycle, we're going to see that reaction previous to it is not very uh, energetically favorable. The second reaction of the cycle, as I noted in closing last time, <coughs> is the reaction that's catalyzed by the enzyme known as aconitase. And aconitase, um, as I noted, um, uh, produces the isocitrate that we can see here. Um, I had a student came to me after class last time and wanted to see this scheme I had for memorizing the structures of the intermediates. And after I showed it to me, he said, oh, it really is simple. So uh, I decided to make you guys memorize the structures. No, I didn't. <laughs> but I could. We've got power here, right? You know, power. Power goes to people's heads, you know? You've got to be careful with power, right? All right. So anyway, um, aconitase catalyzes this reaction. This is simply um, a rearrangement reaction is really all it is. The <clears throat> uh, hydroxyl that was located on this middle carbon here is moved up a carbon. That's really all that's happening um, in this reaction. That movement is necessary because in the next reaction that's catalyzed in the uh, cell, the um, hydroxyl that has been moved will get oxidized. And uh, that oxidation, uh, as we will see, uh, has some consequences uh, for the cell. Okay. Um, this reaction, as I noted, is, uh, is poisoned if there's a fluorine in here. So if I have, instead of having citrate, if I have fluorocitrate, then um, this enzyme is dead in the water, and cells that have this dead enzyme are themselves dead in the water because they can't produce the energy necessary from the citric acid cycle. Okay? When I talked about glycolysis last term, I noted that if we did the oxidation of glucose 
under conditions that were aerobic, meaning their oxygen was present, that the net production of ATP, depending on how you count it, but the net production of ATP was 38. Okay? And if we didn't have oxygen, the net production of ATP from glucose was 2. Okay? So we got 19 times as much glucose when oxygen was present as we had when oxygen was not present. The reason that this happens is because the citric acid cycle produces a lot of NADH. It produces a lot of FADH2. And so when oxygen is present, we have plenty of NAD. We have plenty of FAD. If oxygen is not present, the citric acid cycle can't run, and a cell can't last for very long if the citric acid cycle isn't running. Okay? That is, if there's energy demands on it. Okay? All right, so that's really a critical thing for us to remember as we're going forward. Okay, well, so far we haven't seen anything special. We've put together a four carbon and a two carbon to make a six carbon. We've taken that six carbon and we've rearranged uh, the hydroxyl group on it, but that's really all that we've done so far in the citric acid cycle. In the next reaction, we start getting uh, a little action, uh, as it were, and that next reaction involves an enzyme called isocitrate dehydrogenase. Now, I mentioned it last term, but I'll remind it to you here again. You're going to hear this numerous times this term. Whenever you hear the word dehydrogenase in enzyme name, it means that there's an oxidation. Okay? So there's an oxidation that's going on, and you know from what we talked about last term in glycolysis that wherever there's an oxidation, something is losing electrons and something else is gaining electrons. Okay? So the something that's losing electrons is the isocitrate, and the something that's gaining electrons is NAD. So NAD is going from NAD plus to NADH plus an H plus. So whenever electrons move in the cell, essentially they move in pairs. So we have two electrons that have moved from isocitrate onto NAD. And NAD also picked up one proton. So picking up two minuses and one plus means a net gain of a minus one in terms of charge. So the NAD plus becomes an NAD. H. The other proton that's that was associated with the electrons is simply released into the, um, uh, in this case, the mitochondrion. Okay? Well, the product of this reaction for our purposes, again, we're ignoring the intermediate, but the product of the, this reaction for our purposes is a molecule called alpha, alpha ketoglutarate. And if you want to abbreviate that, you're welcome to call it alpha KG. Okay? That alpha KG okay, is a very useful intermediate for cells because it's very, very easy for cells to convert it into glutamic acid, okay? Very easy. All you have to do is convert that oxygen to an amine, and you've got glutamic acid. So I talked last time about how citric acid cycle intermediates are important in other metabolic pathways. Here's a prime example, okay? Prime example, alpha ketoglutarate is important for um, making glutamic acid. Can it go the other way? Can glutamic acid produce alpha ketoglutarate and go into the citric acid cycle? And the answer is yes, it can, okay? So let's imagine that, like I said last time, imagine that a person is on a high protein diet, low fat, low carbs, they're eating mostly protein, they can stay alive with that, and they stay alive with it by virtue of the fact that their amino acids can be broken down and produce energy. Okay? They can be broken down and produce energy, and this is a prime way of doing that. Okay? Now, this enzyme, as I said, is called alpha, uh, I'm sorry, isocitrate dehydrogenase. Uh, nothing really notable um, about the enzyme uh, for our purposes, um, but um, that's its name, and as you know, you're responsible for the names and the names of the intermediates. Questions on that? Everybody's stunned or else I'm so clear that everybody's got it all figured out? Are you making notes of that? Okay. That was a joke. That's a joke. Yes? So um, when you say we need to know the intermediate, you mean not the oxalic alpha? That's right. So not the transient intermediates. You do not need to know the transient intermediates like, alpha, uh, like oxalosuccinate. Okay? Yeah. Sorry I wasn't clear on that. 
OK, so um, we've gone partway through the cycle. Um, the next step of the reaction is an interesting one. And this is where the uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase that we talked about a lot on Monday comes into play. How does it come into play? Well, let's think about pyruvate. Now, I didn't make you memorize the structure of pyruvate, but I'm going to remind you what it was. Some of you may remember what it, what it is. The structure of pyruvate is as follows. It has a carboxyl at the top. On the second carbon, there's a C double bond oxygen. And on the third carbon, pyruvate only has three carbons, the third carbon is a methyl, CH3. If we look at alpha ketoglutarate, we say, oh, alpha ketoglutarate looks a lot like pyruvate. It's just got something sticking off of the end. OK? Well, that turns out to be important because the action is at this end, both for pyruvate dehydrogenase, which cuts off the carboxyl, and for the, um, alpha, uh, the um, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, which is the enzyme here, that also cuts off this carboxyl. So the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. There's a dehydrogenase again, so you know it's an oxidation. You can call that alpha KGDH if you want. Okay. And this reaction uh, uh, requires NAD because, of course, it's an oxidation. Those electrons have to go somewhere. They go on to NAD. They make NADH. And this is a decarboxylation, just like the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction is a decarboxylation. This decarboxylation, instead of making acetyl-CoA, puts a CoA onto something else. It puts a CoA onto a molecule called succinate. So we produce something called succinyl-CoA instead of producing acetyl-CoA. But in every other respect, that reaction is the same. I got a question, then I'll come back and say something more. Yes? OK, so is the question, is it only NADH, or is it NADH plus H plus? I think the, the plus H plus came off the end. So there is, it is plus H plus. Yeah. OK. Now, this reaction, as I said, is very similar to the alpha ketoglutarate, I'm sorry, to the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction. The pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction, you, required, you recall there were a series of steps that I went through in some detail. And you also recall, hopefully, that there were five different coenzymes that were necessary. This enzyme uses the same basic reaction mechanism, and it uses the exact same five coenzymes. Reminding you what they are, that includes lipoic acid, number one, thiamine pyrophosphate, TPP, coenzyme A, FAD, and NAD. Okay? And just like the other reaction, the product is NADH, and it's a CoA version of something. And it produces carbon dioxide. So a lot of similarities between those. So alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, very, very similar. And it's also similar in structure to pyruvate dehydrogenase as well. OK. All right, so the next uh, step of the process uh, involves the removal of that CoA. OK? The removal of the CoA. Now, um, this enzyme name confuses people. OK? This enzyme name is succinyl CoA synthetase. <laughs> Excuse me. Succinyl CoA synthetase. What does a synthetase do? It makes something. What's this enzyme doing? Why does this enzyme have this name? So the reaction is reversible. That's part of it. Yeah. They were studying it in the other direction when they discovered the enzyme. They were studying the addition of CoA onto succinate. So when they found the enzyme, they called it succinate-CoA synthetase because that's what it did as far as they were concerned. But we remember that reactions are reversible. They go both ways. Okay? So even though the enzyme is named a synthetase in this direction, we still the name has stuck with it, and we keep the enzyme name there. 
Now, notice the other thing that's happening in this reaction. We see a phosphate is being added to GDP to make GTP. Okay? A phosphate is being added to GDP to make GTP. What's the name that we give to that type of a reaction? Substrate level phosphorylation. Excellent. And um, what does it require to do that? High energy. It takes a lot of energy, right? And where does the energy come from in this reaction? It comes from that CoA. The attachment of that CoA, just like in acetyl-CoA, okay? When we saw acetyl-CoA combining with oxaloacetate, we saw that it was energetically favorable. And it was energetically favorable because that S-CoA bond had a lot of energy. And it donated that part of itself, in this case the acetyl group, to the, make the oxaloacetate, uh, combine with the oxaloacetate and make citrate. In this case, the high energy of that bond is applied towards putting a phosphate onto GDP to make GTP. Okay? So that's what's going on uh, in this reaction. Everybody's kind of quiet today. What's going on? Rough Tuesday? Yeah? <laughs> what was so rough about it? <laughs> you weren't in this class on Tuesday, I hate to tell you. It must have really been rough. <laughs> Maybe you had a rough Monday in this class. That could have been. Yes? Oh, very good question. So his question is, hey, you got a high energy bond. To make a high energy bond, you had to have something help you to make that high energy bond. Where did that energy come from? That'd be a, that would have been a good exam question, but now you've asked it, I can't ask that. So, <laughs> Okay, so where did the energy come from? Anybody? Oxidation. You answered your own question. Very good. So the ox this is an oxidation reaction that's going on, and oxidation reactions generally, not always, but generally produce a fair amount of energy. This oxidation reaction provided the driving force necessary to put that CoA onto the succinate. Okay? So that's what's actually happening here. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Um... Okay, so now uh, we get to a, the last set of reactions that end up producing oxaloacetate. Okay, um, here's succinate. This was the product of the last reaction. Okay, the last reaction uh, gave a four-carbon molecule. And by the way, starting with succinate, what you're going to see are, is a series of reactions that you will see very similar reactions occurring again when I. <laughs> Excuse me. When I talk about fatty acid oxidation, so just like we had the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction that was similar to the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase reaction, so too we're going to see that the mechanisms of oxidizing succinate are used very similarly by cells to oxidize fatty acids. Okay, and in some ways succinate is like a fatty acid. The only way succinate differs from the fatty acids is that it has an extra carboxyl at its tail. Okay? Well, this series of reactions that you see on the screen okay, involves two more oxidations. All right? So, so far we've made two oxidations. We've lost two carbon dioxides. The first oxidation, isocitrate dehydrogenase. The second oxidation, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Okay? We're coming up right now on the third oxidation. Okay? The third oxidation involves removal of electrons and protons between these two carbons right here in the middle of the molecule. Okay? This reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme known as succinate dehydrogenase. There's our friend dehydrogenase again. Succinate dehydrogenase catalyzes the transfer of the electrons and both of the protons onto FAD. So each electron has a charge of minus one, each proton has a charge of plus one, 
So the net gain in charge of FAD and going from FAD to FADH2, there's no change in charge. So it starts out with a charge of 0, and it ends up with a charge of 0. Okay. And that reaction, okay, um, uh, what was I going to say? That reaction oh, produces this double bonded intermediate. And this double bonded intermediate has a trans configuration. Now, everything I've just shown you there, you're going to see exactly the same when we go to talk about fatty acid oxidation. Notice we use FAD instead of NAD. We'll see that that actually has some significance later when we talk about the energy that's involved in producing ATP. We'll see that later these guys, the reduced carriers like FADH2 and NADH, can be used to make ATP. And FADH2 will not produce as much ATP as NADH will. Okay? So, why FADH2? People frequently ask me that. Okay? And the answer is partly because removal of these electrons and protons are more difficult to do from the carbons here than they are in, uh, off of a hydroxyl. And so it takes a different kind of electron carrier to facilitate the removal of those protons and electrons and FAD turns out to be the right electron carrier to do just that. Okay. Okay. So the product of that reaction is uh, a molecule called fumarate. And fumarate, we will see when we talk about nucleotide metabolism, appears in nucleotide metabolism. I didn't tell you, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it here since I, I, I should mention it to you. Succinate turns out to be involved as an intermediate in a few places, one of which is in the production of heme. So that heme structure that we saw last term inside of hemoglobin, heme requires succinate uh, to be produced. OK. So fumarate is this trans double bonded molecule that you see here. The next step of the reaction is a very simple one. It's the addition of water across that double bond. And the addition of that water produces this molecule called malate. The enzyme catalyzing this reaction is known as fumarase, F-U-M-A-R-A-S-E. Fumarase catalyzes the formation of malate by simply adding water across the double bond. Well, we're nearing the end, or nearing the completing the circle, I should say, instead of the end, because we don't really have an end. The next reaction of the process is an unusual one. I think it's one of the more unusual reactions that we have in biology. Well, it's a very simple reaction. It's simple because there's a hydroxyl and it's getting oxidized to a ketone. That means loss of electrons. And those electrons go on to NAD and produce NADH. This is the fourth and final oxidation that happens in the citric acid cycle. What's so unusual about it? What's unusual about it is this reaction is not very energetically favorable. It's a rare oxidation that is not very energetically favorable. The delta G0 prime for this reaction is positive. And that means that if we start with equal quantities of, of the substrate and product, that the reaction would actually go backwards if there weren't other things to consider. Well, what happens in the cell, of course, is it doesn't really get good, a good chance to go backwards. And the reason is because exaloacetate gets pulled away by the citrate synthase. Okay? It gets pulled away by the citrate synthase reaction. Because the citrate synthase reaction is very energetically favorable. It removes the exaloacetate, which means that the product of this reaction is being taken away. And that pulls the reaction forwards. So as a consequence, the cycle is complete. And as a consequence, the entire cycle overall is very energetically favorable. OK, believe it or not, we've just completed the cycle. Time to What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. The, good, good question. The enzyme is, is uh, malate dehydrogenase. Thank you. Malate dehydrogenase. So it's a rare oxidation that's happening inside the cells that's not very energetically favorable. 
Questions? Other questions about that? Okay, this might be a good place to stretch. I think everybody looks a little worn. Let's just take a break. Stand up. Stretch. Nobody's standing up. Why is this? St I would stand up and, oh, yeah. Good for you. Brave, very brave man. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. So this shows the, um, the overall cycle with all the names of the molecules, the enzymes, and the structures. Um, I like that structure uh, a lot. And it also shows us what happens to the carbons coming in and the carbons going out. We saw two carbons coming in in green. And now when you look and you see the carbon dioxide's going away, you'll notice the carbon dioxide's going away are not green. That means that we don't lose carbons from the acetyl-CoA until the second time they go around the cycle. We don't lose those carbons until the second time they go around the cycle. The first time around, you're oxidizing previous ones. You'll see that the green, they, they take it off of here, but there's no green carbon dioxides coming off. So it takes two runs of the cycle before we start getting carbon dioxides coming off from the original acetyl-CoA. OK. Um, that's what I want to say there. Here's a summary of this uh, process overall in terms of uh, energy. And look at that positive delta G0 prime for that malate dehydrogenase reaction. Okay? Look how it gets pulled. Plus 29.7, minus 31.4. Okay? Here's a nice negative one also. The alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase reaction, very energetically favorable. And in many ways, we can think about this guy as being like the Big Bang we talked about last term. What was the Big Bang? Anybody remember? It was the pyruvate kinase reaction. And why did we call it the Big Bang? Very energetic, right? It was very energetic. And it was energetic enough that we could have actually made a second ATP, right? Well, this guy is very similar in that respect. Notice that what we do is we produce okay, energy, we produce uh, an NADH, and more importantly, we produce a succinyl-CoA, which is a high-energy molecule. And we still have plenty of energy left over. So this energy, this, this alpha-ketoglutarate alpha dehydrogenase reaction is very, very uh, energetically productive. Whenever we see things like these very negative values that we see for delta G0 prime, it means that we can, in fact, produce a fair amount of heat the more we run them. So last term, we talked about how the more we run glycolysis, the more heat we produce, and that's why we get hot and we go running and we sweat and so on and so forth. The same thing is true here. The more we run this citric acid cycle, the more heat as a byproduct we're going to produce. Yes? Yeah, oh, okay. So that's a good observation. So he's notice, noting here that this says ATP instead of GTP. This varies from one species to the next. So the one I showed you before, humans actually produce GTP, but some other species like bacteria will produce ATP. In, 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 but it's the same energetically, it's the same thing, but, but good, good eyes, good eyes. Yes? Sure. The aconitase reaction uh, is, is not the one that's pulled. So the one that's pulled is actually this guy right here. Here? That's not very positive. So it doesn't take much. I mean, it's not, remember that we're, we're talking about delta G zero primes. These aren't delta G values, but these are tendencies, right? So a, a relatively small one like that doesn't really have any, anything that needs to pull it. If we think about it, this will push it. And we think about it, these guys will also pull it. Okay, but that's not a very big barrier to overcome. Not a very big barrier. But good question. Yeah. 
Other questions? Clear as mud? You guys ready for a joke? We should start the term off with a joke. I can't remember if I've told you this joke or not about the, the genie and the three wishes. I haven't told you the genie and the three wishes joke. Okay. All right. So um, there's this guy, right? There's always this guy. And he's walking down the street, and he, he finds this magic bottle laying in the street, right? And he grabs it and, you know, rubs the bottle, and this genie pops out. Three wishes, oh, master, you know? Okay. And so um, he says, well, he thinks about it for a second. He says, you know, he says, I'd really like to be a really rich man. And so, poof, into his hands appears the certificate, and it tells him that he has a billion dollars in a Swiss bank account. Wow. This is just awesome. This is wonderful. Okay. He's kind of admiring that, you know. And Ginny says, and what would your second wish be, old master? And he says, well, he says, I guess he said I'd like to be a really powerful person. Poof. He gets a certificate in his hands, and it says that he's the president of General Motors. Okay. Wow. That's really awesome. Pick your company. Name, name your company here, okay? That's really amazing. Apple Computer, okay? I, I'm the president, okay? You know? Genie says, okay, master, what will the third wish be? He thinks, he says, well, he says, I've got money. I've got power. His smile comes on his face, and he says, and I want every woman to love me. And poof, he turns into a box of chocolates. <laughs> okay. You thought it was going to be a bad joke, didn't you? It was a bad joke in some ways. OK. All right. Stereotyping there. OK. We're not going to do that. So uh, let's um, think now about the regulation. The regulation of this cycle is fairly straightforward. OK? If we, as we look um, at the cycle, we see that it's fed by glycolysis. Glycolysis produces pyruvate. Pyruvate dehydrogenase complex gives us acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA feeds into the citric acid cycle and produces carbon dioxide. It can produce other things as well. Okay? Now, we remember that wherever we have an oxidation, that NAD is needed. And you've seen now in the citric acid cycle that in addition to needing NAD, you also need FAD. Okay? If we run short of NAD or if we run short of FAD, the cell is going to be in trouble. Okay? I shouldn't say trouble because it doesn't have necessarily have to be trouble, but it could be trouble if a cell is a muscle cell and can't, uh, for example, uh, produce what it needs. Okay? The regulatory points in the cycle, and this looks more confusing than it really is, are shown here. They're shown in red and in green, and you can ignore them for the most part. How many times do I tell you that? Okay? You can ignore these for the most part, because, okay, the allosteric effectors don't really have much of a role. Okay? The limiting, limitations of the cycle are the available, availability of NAD and FAD. Notice, NADH is in red, means it turns it off. Okay? Notice, NADH in red turns it off. NADH in red turns it off. You can put the same thing over here with FA, FADH2 in red. Okay. So now that turns out to be really important. How do we get NAD and how do we get FAD? Well, soon we're going to talk about the process of oxidative phosphorylation, and that's involving electron transport, and it's in electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation that NADH and FADH2 are converted into NAD and FAD. Okay. What does that mean? It means then that electron transport, which requires oxygen, means that when cells start running out of oxygen, electron transport can't run. And when electron transport can't run, you can't convert NADH and FADH2 into their oxidized forms, FAD and NAD. And when that happens, the, cells doesn't, the cell doesn't have the citric acid cycle going on. Now, do you start to see why we talked about fermentation last term, that muscle cell that needed to have fermentation going, the importance of that? 
Because if that muscle cell doesn't have fermentation going on, what's going to happen is it's got no ATP source at all. It's in deep doo-doo. Okay? So running out of oxygen can really be harmful to cells, and that, that fermentation will keep it going for a while. Okay? If you're a muscle cell, muscle cells can burn things up pretty quickly. That's why it's important that muscle cells have the Cori cycle to feed them. Okay? It's very important that they have it. Now, what we're going to see is that this requirement for NAD and FAD is really the root of what we call respiratory control. Respiratory control relates to how the respiration state of the cell affects the metabolic pathways within it. I'll repeat that. Respiratory control relates to how the respiratory state of the cell affects the pathways within it. Cells that are deprived of oxygen okay, are going to have very different circumstances than cells that have abundant oxygen. We can also see this from other perspectives. Okay? Let's imagine that, um, actually, let me, let me save that. Let me, let me save that for a second. Okay? All right. Um, uh, let's not worry about that. And let's not worry about that. Okay. This, uh, I'm, I'm going to come back to, to uh, respiratory control in a minute. Okay. Before I talk about that, I want to just remind you of some of the anaplerotic reactions of the citric acid cycle. Okay. So the anaplerotic, reac anaplerotic reactions of the citric acid cycle, I've mentioned them as I've gone along, some of them. Okay. You saw that alpha ketoglutarate could go to glutamic acid, which in turn can go to other uh, amino acids. Glutam glutamate is a very good source of nitrogen to pass on to other amino acids. And we'll see uh, that happen a little bit later on. We see succinyl-CoA and succinate being sources of porphyrins, heme, and chlorophyll. Okay? And oxaloacetate, in addition, uh, is important for making or being um, um, produced by aspartic acid. Okay? The one that's not shown on there is fumarate. Fumarate is involved in nucleotide metabolism. Okay. Let's see. I guess I don't. Uh, hold on. I'm not looking for something and I don't see it on here. All right. Well, let's let's take a minute then and talk about respiratory control. So let's think about what it, what it means from the perspective of of um, a, uh, a a cell. From what we've seen so far, we'll talk more about respiratory control when I talk about uh, the uh, process of oxidative phosphorylation. Let's imagine that I am um, exercising heavily. Exercising heavily, what is my status of ATP? Low or high? Low. What is the status of oxygen in my uh, muscle cells? Low. Okay. And when oxygen is low, what is the status of my NAD and NADH? Trick question. So one's low, one's high, right? So NAD is low, NADH is high. When NADH is high, what happens to citric acid cycle? Stops, right? OK, you got that, you got that down. All right, let's imagine I do the converse thing. I uh, decide I'm not going to exercise. And instead, I am going to sit on my butt and eat pizza, drink beer, and watch the tube. Yeah. What's going to happen to my ATP concentrations? High? OK. What's going to happen to my NAD concentrations? Yeah. OK. Well, one of the things we're going to learn, it's a little confusing. One of the things that we're going to learn is that um, when the um, uh, cell has a chance to catch up with everything, it makes plenty of NADH. When you're sitting around, you're not oxidizing things, your NADH concentrations go up. When your NADH concentrations go up, what's going to happen to the citric acid cycle? It's also going to stop, right? So if you're not burning things up, citric acid cycle is very good for producing 
ATP on a regular basis. You're burning it up, you're exercising, and so forth. But when you're sitting around doing nothing, citric acid cycle is going to, at, le at the very least, slow down. And when it slows down, what happens is the concentration of cit citrate accumulates. Why? Well, the very first reaction that requires NAD is isocitrate dehydrogenase reaction. Isocitrate accumulates quickly. Citrate accumulates. As citrate accumulates, what happens to the reaction before it? Well, the reaction before it was the, was the um, energetically unfavorable malate dehydrogenase reaction. I'm sorry, back up on that. I'm saying the thing the wrong way. As citrate accumulates, the citrate synthase reaction will be slowed down, right? The citrate synthase reaction slows down, acetyl-CoA is going to go up, right? Now, that's the point I want to make here. We're going to, I'll remind you of this later. As acetyl-CoA goes up, you are going to get fat. Because acetyl-CoA is needed to make fatty acids. And when the cell is loaded with ATP, and it's loaded with, with acetyl-CoA, the cell's got no choice to do anything but make fatty acids. You want an argument for exercise? There it is. Okay? Now, I'm sketching these out. I know they're not going to be clear in your head to you at this point, but I'm sketching these out for you because I will talk about these in more depth when I talk about the oxidative phosphorylation. I'm going to remind you of what I've just told you here. Okay? Very important to keep these things in mind. Okay, questions about that? I'm just kind of rambling at the moment. So what's new, right? Okay. Um, one of the things that's interesting relating to the citric acid uh, cycle um, actually is um, um, this reaction right here. Okay, so let me, let me back up here. So this uh, reaction relates to the, the oxidation of pyruvate. It also relates to a lesser extent to the oxidation of alpha ketoglutarate. Okay? Both of those enzymes require lipoic acid. And lipoic acid, you may remember, has that sulfhydryl on the side. It starts out as a disulfide, but there's a period of time where it exists as a sulfhydryl. If you are consuming water, as many people in the world are, that contain arsenic, okay, it's not a problem in this country much, but in many places in the world it is, consuming, a, um, uh, consuming water or anything that has arsenic, for that matter, it doesn't have to just be water, Arsenic will combine with that lipoic acid side chain of the SHs and make this intermediate right here that stops this from forming a disulfide bond. And you remember that the reformation of that disulfide bond was necessary to put pyruvate dehydrogenase back in its original state. Arsenic is very poisonous for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons being that it knocks out pyruvate dehydrogenase and it knocks out alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Both of those reactions are critical. Now, it turns out that the arsenic can be removed, and a treatment, if you get it early enough for a person who's had arsenic poisoning, a treatment is this guy up here. Because what it will do is it'll actually take this arsenic away from the lipoic acid and attach it to itself. that frees the uh, lipoic acid within the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase to go do its thing. Okay? Make sense? All right. Now, the last thing I'm going... Uh, here's a whole cycle at the end of the lecture, right? The last thing I'm going to talk about, and I'll talk about it at the beginning of next time also, is a very interesting react cycle. It's actually related to the citric acid cycle. And the reason I only give a very short period of time for it is because it basically is the citric acid cycle, except for it has two different enzymes that bypass reactions in a part of the citric acid cycle. What does that mean? Well, let's take a look at this. Here is citrate synthase from the citric acid cycle. Here is aconitase from the citric acid cycle. We produce isocitrate. But certain cells, and by the way, these certain cells include plants and bacteria, they have an enzyme called isocitrate lyase. Isocitrate lyase catalyzes the breakdown of isocitrate into two things. One is a molecule called, excuse me, glyoxalate, and the other is our friend succinate. 
What happens to succinate? Well, succinate can be converted into fumarate, can be converted into malate, can be converted into oxaloacetate. So if we think about this kind of going around here to here to here, we've got this guy paralleling what's happening here. Look at what's happening in here. Glyoxylate is being added to another acetyl-CoA, and it makes malate. Now, this is fundamentally different than what happened in the um, reaction of the citric acid cycle, because in the citric acid cycle, we had two decarboxylations. We lost two carbon dioxides. Here, we've lost no carbons. In fact, we've added two more carbons. And as a consequence, at the end, we have two oxaloacetates, not one. That means every time that the glyoxylate cycle turns, there's one extra oxaloacetate. What's oxaloacetate good for that you learned last term? Synthesis of what? Glucose. Because of the glyoxylate cycle, plants and bacteria can make glucose starting with acetyl-CoA. We, as the supposedly most highly evolved beings on the face of the earth, cannot do that. We cannot do that. Okay? Not in net amounts. We can't do it. Right? Now, students say, well, when does the bacteria run this cycle, and when do they run the other cycle? And I say, well, it depends on needs. If the cells have plenty of energy, and they don't need NADH, and they don't need ATP, but they do need glucose, this cycle becomes very favorable. Notice that this cycle didn't have any decarboxylations. Notice that this cycle only had one NAD requirement. So if NADH concentrations are high and NAD is low, this cycle is going to be favored compared to the citric acid cycle, which requires three NADHs, not just one. Uh, three NADs, not just one. Make sense? What do you say we finish it off with a song? This song is one that actually was not written by me. It was written by one of my students. It was a TA in the class a few years ago, and she wrote a beautiful song called Citrate Sonata. I hope you'll join me. Our fats and carbs get broken down to acetyl-CoA. Oxaloacetate combines in cycles TCA. The product of reaction 1-O-citrate is its name. Isocitrate, the product that ensues. Atoms got moved. Isocitrate is the product of step two. And oxidation soon occurs, reducing NAD. An alpha keto glutarate resulting from step three. From here we could make glutamate, that is if there's a need. Don't forget that we lost a CO2. Yes, it is true. In reaction three, we lost a CO2. So what's the point of all these steps? Well, let me tell you, friend. We use electron carriers and working towards our end of synthesizing ATP, a metabolic trend. Oxidize and then oxidize some more. Here in step four, ketoglutarate gets oxidized some more. The enzyme with cofactors five, including TPP, lipoate, FAD, CoA, and also NAD. A succinyl that's on CoA is what gets made, you see. This reaction occurs so favorably, don't you agree? It's a good reaction energetically. With four more steps, we're halfway there, so let me summarize. When CoA is lost, we see that GTP is synthesized. The succinate that is produced will soon get oxidized. FAD goes to FADH2. What did we do? We made futurate and FADH2. Add water, cross the double bond, and malate we create. With one last NAD, we can then dehydrogenate to give a final product of oxaloacetate. It's removed, and this lowers delta G. Oh, yes, indeed, 
It's through pulling that this last step can proceed. So take a breath, you've learned it all, but what is it you say that's of such great importance that I need to take away? Three NADs have been reduced, each now NADH, GTP and an FADH2. They were made too. Yes, a GTP and FADH2. We've passed electrons, eight in all. We've made two CO2s. Triphosphates like our GTP give energy to you. Electron transport is the chain that certainly ensues. But I think that deserves another song. This is too long. And with that, I and our citrates sing along. All right, see you guys on Friday. <laughs>